going to join me for the song.
Page 48 is right next door. Page to the left, I lift my eyes up.
cast our cares at your feet. That we might, Lord, lay the things that get in our way down at the foot of the cross of your Son, where we might, where we might find victory, Lord, and freedom from our burdens. Father, as we read your word tonight, we ask that you would, Father, inspire us, revive us, refresh us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Zechariah chapter 10 is where we're going to be. Zechariah um, chapter 10. Yeah. Uh, I think it's uh, really important that we uh, uh, get on our hands and knees before the Lord for Abba because uh, I've been there. I've been there many of them. I know what I wish it's going through. And uh, just tell the Lord we just want to bring her to Him, right. to Jesus. That's why we want him here, mm -hmm. just so we can lead him to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I think it's most important that we should all get on our hands and knees pray. Well, let's come down to the altar then, and we'll, we'll pray together. <laughs> Father, we have gathered here at this altar in your holy name, in the name of Jesus Christ. And we join together with Richard and with Richie. And we ask, Father, that you give deliverance. Or the most important thing in that is life, is salvation, and service for Jesus Christ. So, Father, I pray that you would give the victory. For sometimes we look close day by day. Sometimes it seems as though we're losing ground. Father, you never lose. You've never lost the battle. Father, you won't lose this tonight. So, Father, help us. Help us, Father, to see what you're doing. Help us, Father, to be careful to listen to what our part is supposed to be. Father, we do pray that we can have at us in our service. Regular, Father. That's our request. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
So notice what he says next, and this is really what gets me. He says, ask the Lord for rain. But then he says, in the time of the latter rain. Ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. Yehovah will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. The Lord, through Zechariah here, reminds us that there are conditions of prayer. Notice, the Lord says, ask at a certain time. Ask for rain when in my creation I have designed it to rain. He doesn't say ask for rain in the times between the rainy season. He says during the times that I have promised rain, and they, they have the latter rain that we read about here, that's actually the springtime rain, and then they also depend on the former rain. You'll read about these in Scripture in the Old Testament, the latter and the former rains. That's the spring rain and the fall rain. These are the seasonal rains that the farmers depended on. They depended on the former rain of the fall when they would plant their crops, to get the seed germinated, to get it moving, to get it growing. And they depended on the latter rain during the springtime to bring in that harvest, to, to bring their crops to fruition, to make them good for a harvest. And the Lord says, ask me for rain during the rainy season. He, he doesn't say, ask me for rain in between. And I, I find that utterly provocative. And it reminds me that the Lord... He has a will and a way. And he wants us to get in line with how he does things. Ask for rain, but ask it on my timeline. Ask for rain, but ask it under my design, according to my will. Notice it forbids, really, it, it, it prevents the, the, the prayer, the, the whim, really. Lord, I just want you to do something for me. I want it to rain right now. Well, it's not the rainy season, so tough luck, kid. <laughs> the Lord says, ask for rain when it's supposed to rain. And I find that very interesting. And it reminds me of all the places in the scripture where the Lord, whether by his prophets, his apostles, or even by his own son, reminds us that are, there are certain conditions when it comes to prayer. We need to understand the Lord has a way. The Lord has a will. We may not understand His ways, and we may be frustrated by His will sometimes. But He wants us to pray according to His ways and according to His will. He has designed creation in a certain way to operate. Like, for instance, when it comes to these rains in that area of the world, there are the seasonal rains. And He has designed it in a certain way. Here's how you're supposed to plant, and here's when the rains are supposed to come. I want you to get on board with my greater plan. I don't want you to go out on your own and try to force the issue. I want you to stay within the boundaries of my ways and of my will. I want you to get used to praying according to my ways and my will, the Lord is saying to us. And there are some conditions when it comes to prayer. First, we sort of mentioned one, as, as far as it relates to prayer as a whim. You know, James talks about praying that we might waste the thing we're looking for on our own lust. Praying for th things that are simply designed to be expended in a selfish way. Lord, I want this thing just for me. Now, the scripture declares that our Father is loving and that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights. And yet, the same author, James, the one who said that, also said that he doesn't want us to pray selfishly. The Lord has a way. He has a will. Pray to the Lord, but pray according to His way and His will. Not that you might spend it on your own lust. Pray according to God's heart. We don't see Jesus praying selfish prayers. The, the, the devil tempted him in that way. When Jesus was starving nearly to his death in the wilderness, the devil says, turn these rocks into stone. Ask that the Father might turn these rocks into bread for you to eat. And Jesus says, no, no, no. 
that that's not what it's about. You see, the Lord has given us our daily bread. And we are not to live by mere physical bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. See, I'm not sent here to waste my prayer life on myself, on things that are simply selfish in nature, that have no use in the ways and plan of God, that have no use in blessing the church of God. They're simply for me. It's like a little spoiled brat. Oh, Father, give me this thing. I want this thing now. But I've given you all these other things, and you haven't even used those things. Or, oh, I don't care about them. Give me this thing now. Give me this thing next. And they're always looking for that next spiritual high. And they're spoiled little Christian brats who haven't learned the heart of their father, who haven't learned to love their neighbor. Another condition of prayer, the Lord speaks about our relationship to others being very important as we pray. He speaks to husbands in particular, but I believe to the marriage relationship in general. And he says to the husband, hey, if, if you are not treating your wife right, if there's problems in the home, don't expect I'm going to listen to you. You make sure that that relationship is right, that it is in order, that there is love there. I have commanded you to love your wife. Now, I believe that also would apply to a wife. That her relationship should be right with her husband if she's going to expect to be heard in heaven. And then I think we can also apply the story that Jesus told. When he said, when you bring your gift to the altar and you remember that there's somebody that has a problem with you. There's a broken relationship somewhere. Leave your gift there and go and make it right. I think we, we might apply this to prayer. You know, you, you come to the Lord's altar to seek his face in prayer. And yet, you remember that there's a problem. There's a relationship that is broken down. There's an issue that you need to see to. Don't just cast it off and ignore it. And then just think, well, oh, Lord, everything's okay between us at least, right? Who, who cares that I'm so mean to everybody else? As long as, as long as you and me, yeah, I can pray to you. The Lord would say, no, no, no. I want you to care about others. And I want you to understand, if you're going to open your mouth before me, your relationships on earth better be right before you can expect your relationship between heaven and earth to be right. You go take care of that thing before you expect me to hear your prayer. See, prayer is something that is to flow out of the heart. And it is, it is something that is designed to flow out of a heart filled with God's love, God's joy, God's peace. It is something that is to flow out of a heart that is righteous in its standing before the Father. That is how we will learn to pray according to His ways and according to His will. When we make sure that we are not praying selfishly, when we make sure that we are not going to God and neglecting our relationships on earth, then we can expect that God is now in a place in our life where He can conform us to His ways, to His will, that we might be able to pray according to His ways and according to His will. Which brings us obviously to the book of 1 John, where that writer declares, if we pray according to His will, then we know He has heard us, and that we have the petition which we have, which we have asked for. And if our heart is right, we're going to be in a better place to understand the ways and the will of God. Those are the prayers that the Lord hears and answers. He hears everybody's prayer. But there are certain people who get their prayers answered because they are praying according to the will of their Father. And it is important that our heart is in a place where we can discern His will. Where our hearts are open and tender before Him. Where our ears are sensitive to His voice. Where when we are in a place where we are truly in His presence in our daily and practical life, that we are familiar with His voice, that we know what His will is for us. And when we don't know what His will is, we are so dependent upon Him that we don't mind praying according to the Holy Spirit, like Romans 8 tells us, where we can just lift up to the Lord our heart, the groanings of our heart, and believe that He's going to do what's right that the Holy Spirit will intercede 
for us. Because sometimes it's true. We don't mentally know. We don't know how to pray sometimes with our understanding. We don't know exactly what to ask for. But we have learned to depend on God. Our heart is right before Him. And we have learned now to trust whatever He will do. And we are diligent to pray for that to be accomplished, whatever His will may be. And the closer we get to the cross of Christ, the more in tune we will be with that kind of prayer. It's one thing to have a sense by His Spirit that we know His will and we can pray according to that will. But it's quite another leap of faith to pray like Jesus. Not my will, not what I think you should do, but Lord, let your will be done. Whatever that may mean to me. And we really want to get to that place in prayer where we can just open our hearts to the Lord and trust Him to work. And we may have something we want to see happen, and yet we are content with closing our prayers with the words of Jesus, but Father, not my will, if you have something better. Father, I really want your will to be accomplished. If I'm in tune with your will, then let it be done. Amen, in the name of Jesus. But Father, if there's something wrong with my prayer, if I'm not quite on it, Lord, let your will be done above mine. There's surrender there. That's what Jesus was doing in the garden. He was surrendering His will, His ways to the Father and allowing the Father to do what He desired to do in the Son. And we never want to be in that place where the Father is able to work in our life according to whatever His will may be. And He knows that we're going to be a faithful servant and accomplish that very thing. Ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. I think this also speaks of patience. Because we so often want something now. We want to see the Lord working right in this moment. And we sometimes can be very desperate. Lord, I need this to happen now. And I think this also reminds me, the Lord doesn't just have a will and a way, but He also has a time. You know, it's such a pretty song. Um, that he has sung on, on occasion in his time. And yet, it really is difficult to trust in his time. It's one thing to sing a song about trusting and waiting on the Lord. And Lord, in your time, in his time, whatever that may be, I'm going to trust in it. But what a different thing it is to have to come into your prayer closet and have the Lord whisper in your ear, wait, let it be in my time. And that's really what he's telling the people here. I want you to pray for rain, but I want you to pray for it in the appointed time. The Bible says that Jesus came in the appointed time. And the Bible seems to indicate that the Lord, the Father, has an appointed time for everything. It's appointed that everyone must die. There's an appointed time where we meet our Maker. I don't know when that is, but it's in His time. Whenever that may be, it's in His time. When we have a prayer request, we, we are concerned for Atlas. It's going to be in His time, according to His ways and according to His will. You have the prayers that are on your heart, the prayers that are on my heart, the things that we deal with in our own families and spheres of influences, and yet the Lord would say to you, and He says to me, it's, it's in my time. I'm going to do this according to my will, according to my way, and it's going to be in my time. Hopefully we get the hint, because it's all over Scripture. The Lord continues to remind us, I'm going to do it my way, not your way. I'm going to do it according to my will, not yours. I'm going to do it in my time frame, not your time frame. How many Christians have waited for the return of Jesus? And Jesus said, not time yet. It'll be in my time. Every Christian desires to meet the Lord in the air rather than go through death. It's, it's our great hope. It's that blessed hope. We're yearning for the return of Christ and that He might rapture us to be with Him rather than meet Him through death. And yet, how many Christians have heard? Not yet in my time. You are appointed to die. You are appointed to go through that valley, through that shadow. There is that generation. We may be part of it. We may not be part of it. That will skip death. That will be raptured up. Because it will be in His time. Now, it can be so difficult. For instance, we've just brought up the rapture. And there have been phases in the church where the church 
in a, in a broad way, has gotten excited about the return of Jesus. Has gotten excited about the rapture. The, I think the last really um, exciting time where the church as a whole was sort of feeling and yearning for the rapture was perhaps during my dad's youth, during those that late 60s, early 70s, where it was one way, Jesus, we can't wait to meet him in the air. I don't think we've seen a time since then where so many people were so excited and expectant of the rapture since really that generation. And it, for instance, before I go on to make the point, uh, I've heard one pastor tell a story of, of, of how deeply he was expecting, of, of how much he anticipated, because he was a new Christian, this is in the early 70s, he's accepted the Lord, and he's being taught about the rapture, and it just seems like all of his friends and all of the church, they're just waiting for it. And he says, uh, so he was with his friend, and his friend was just as fanatic as, as he was. Just, oh yeah, the rapture, any minute, I'm just ready all the time for the Lord. And his friend was even more zealous than he was. His friend had been saved for a little longer. And so they're driving in their car, and uh, uh, the guy telling the story, he's driving. And he makes a turn, and apparently the passenger door was, was uh, ajar a little bit. And so when the turn was made, it came open. And he noticed his friend starts going out like this, like, Whoa, Jesus, I'm coming for you. And he has to pull him back. And he's like, What are you doing? He's like, Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought it was the rapture. And I figured Jesus is a gentleman. He opened the door for me. And he's like, You crazy fool. I'm just making a turn. Your door came open. But see, there was a time when people were so expectant that they had that sense that it could really be any day. You've heard the pastor say, hey, if you saw that uh, a cloudy day, he ain't Jesus supposed to come in the clouds, it could be today. And yet, the ramifications of getting that excited, the ramifications of fleshly men, even though they might be Christians, of getting that excited and then something not happening right then and right there in that time, we have seen in the church a great, it's almost like there's a cynicism when you hear the rapture spoken of. Oh, yeah, we waited for that back then. Ah, oh, he ain't going to come in my lifetime. Ah, oh, yeah, well, I, I don't even know about the rapture anymore. And there's a real cynicism, and there, I believe there has been a waning of the excitement that the rapture once brought people, because it wasn't in their time. See, they wanted Jesus to come right then. They were saved, they were ready, they were ready to go. And then he did it. And then a decade goes by. And then 25 years. And then a few more decades. And I think we're here quite a ways away from when my dad had long hair. <laughs> and people can get cynical. Christians can get cynical when they are forced to be patient. See, Job came to a place in his patience where the Lord was able to break him. Instead of getting cynical, he was broken by the Lord. That is our model. To have the patience like Job. Job didn't want everything that happened to him to happen to him. And I'm sure after he lost everything and had to go through those terrible trials and having to bury ten of his children, all ten of his children, I'm sure he would desire that the Lord would restore him right away. And yet, in the beginning of Job, we read in the first couple of two, two three chapters where he loses everything, and then you have to go through about 45 chapters where he's suffering. See, the trial hit him quick. And then he was stuck in it for page after page after page after page. Now the Lord did restore him eventually. But it was in the time of the Lord after he had produced patience in Job. After he brought Job where he wanted Job to be. And where was that? Job confesses Lord, I have heard about you with the hearing of the ear, but now I've seen you, and I repent, and I humble myself in dust and ashes. I'm not quoting you quite right, but it's something like that. I heard about you. I, I used to think I knew you, but now I have seen you, and I realize that what you do is right, and I'm going to trust you, even though I've suffered so greatly and so severely. That is what the Lord wants to do with our lives as it relates to patience. Let's uh, go to a verse in Romans as we close. Romans chapter 5.
read the first several verses of the chapter. He says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where our relationship begins. It begins at the cross where we are justified. And that justification brings us peace with God as, as it relates to our sins and as it relates to His judgment. We're no longer suffering under the penalty of our sin. We're no longer under the doom of His judgment. There is peace between you and God, between me and my Maker. Through whom also, through Jesus, whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory, now here's where it gets tricky for the Christian. We also glory in tribulations. You see, if we have truly understood what the cross has done in our life, it is then that we can glory in earthly tribulations. Once we have a sense of what peace with God means, that I have been saved from the terrible doom and judgment of hell, that I'm no longer under the judgment of God, that when it comes to my spiritual soul, when it comes to my eternal state, I know that I'm safe and secure.